Welcome everyone. Tonight we are so excited to have mission driven programs with three highly successful programming gurus for our AAUW and I'm going to introduce um, one of them who's going to lead the lead the way and um, and introduce the rest and um, let's see here now. I'm going to introduce my buddy. I think Nancy is drinking wine. I am not. This is water. Water. Look at this. Water. The wine comes after. Maybe it's vodka. No. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So first off, we're going to talk about Miss Pat, Squ Pat Squire. She is my buddy in crime, as you well know, Pat Squire is our program vice president for AAUW of Oregon. She's a past director of the alumni relations at Port St Portland State University. And so you can see this one, this picture that's currently on screen is one of her professional life. When she was doing that, um, she talks and they listen. So I'm pretty impressed with Pat Squire. And when she talks, I listen or I turn, take my headphones off and pretend to listen. And then <laughs> Pat retired and got Jeez. really involved in AAUW. And so these were in the newsletter thing she sent me. And so I know she loves to cook. And there she is in her adorable flamenco apron. And I think she was doing some cooking lunch, I don't know, cooking bunch that you all do. And she also loves to travel. And this is a picture of Pat in France. Um, Unfortunately, she hasn't been able to do that much lately. So she and I have been traveling up and down the freeway a couple of times, uh, vetting uh, facilities for when we can meet in person. So we are our travel buddies. But her most important thing today, and many of you know this already, is that she is the proud mama of oh. these two gorgeous five-month-old cats, oh. Etta and Tina. Oh, uh huh. They're adorable, and if you ask, she will tell you all about them. See, they even have their own high-rise condo, and they can look out into the garden. They're not spoiled. But anyway, I want to welcome Pat Squire and her buddies in crime about programming. Pat. <laughs> Little did I know you would share those kinds of pictures, Nancy. <laughs> you told me to do what I wanted. Yeah, I guess I did. Okay, well, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce Linda Liebecker and Linda Lofton. Many of you know Linda Liebecker. She was uh, immediately before me the co-vice president for programs for the state and led us through, I think, three conventions, Linda, yeah. and three summer workshops. So um, she's from Hillsborough Forest Grove branch. She uh, kind of started her career in the library field where she did a lot of programming for adults, uh, educational programming. And she was branch uh, vice president for programs. She's also been, you know, several other officers in the branch, including co-president. Um, she's pretty amazing in terms of programming and she's going to talk about some of the ways that they do things. Linda Lofton is from the Portland branch and she's a lifelong educator as she tells me. Uh, she's been a teacher, a principal, she's in charge, was in charge of training and supervising. She has <laughs> put on, a, this is challenging to me, a three-day conference for special ed um, Head Start special ed teachers, and she's still doing it. Now that's a three day conference, please. Um, she's yeah. currently teaching for girls in a pod and she is a nine year member of the Portland branch. She calls herself a new member, but that's about how long I spent in the Lake Oswego branch. So, um, but she's lived outside of the US for many years. So um, I, they probably have cats or maybe dogs, but I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of them. Um, but we are going to start by having um, a brief overview of what we're trying to accomplish. What we want to do is talk about different ways to do programs. You know, we've got all sizes and locations of branches, and we're not saying our way is the best. We want to hear from all of you but we're gonna talk a little bit about how we've each done programming. 
Um, I do want to remind members that during the summer skills uh, camp, uh, Pat Lehman led a wonderful session on exemplary programs from branches. And it did include some smaller branches and some really cool programs. So you can look at that on YouTube, on the AAUW Oregon YouTube. Um, so new program vice presidents, if you are here and joining us, you should feel free to adopt a way that suits your branch and that is gonna work with your way of, of thinking but also fit in with your branch. And I think the most important thing that we all wanna reiterate is that we wanna keep AAUW's mission in mind. And if your branch has a strategic plan or if it doesn't, but the state does have a strategic plan and national AAUW has a strategic plan. So you wanna keep those in mind when you design your programs. So we're gonna start off with Linda Lofton talking about the way she's been doing programs. Linda. Thank you. I, I told Pat and Linda the other day that program planning for our branch, I think, is unique in that as the largest city in Oregon, Portland offers many organizations to choose from in addressing issues that are highlighted in our state and national mission statement. But as a large city, there are many programs that compete for our audience's attention. Um, our branch makes program decisions by committee. Right now, there are four of us, usually five, and each one of us has our own networks of experts and uh, professionals that we can draw from. Sometimes those professionals are through the things that we read. And so um, we meet in June and July to decide the annual calendar of programs and events. And as we try to appeal to all of our members' interests, those choices tend to fall into four categories. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about three of those, and then later I'll talk more in depth about um, the collaborative kinds of things we do with other organizations. Um, but the first group, I think, are more at a personal level. Once or twice a year, we gather to address issues that impact physical or mental health. Um, like in 2019, we invited a gynecologist to discuss postmenopausal issues and questions women our age may have. And we combined it with a, a traditional tea because as you all know, food tends to draw more people, but it was very personal and people felt like they were in a safe place to ask the questions that they've always wanted answers to. Um, another example of that is that in 2020, we did a workshop called The Art of Living and Dying Well. And um, the facilitator led us through a reflection on our own lives and the steps to take to ensure that the next chapter uh, will be on our own terms and that we leave behind the legacy that's important to us. So you can imagine that it was very emotional, but people really could talk about what was important to them and share that with each other. Um, so that's the first personal type, but the second type that I've noticed that we do is to offer programs that pique interest uh, in issues that might provoke a response to get involved in that way. And so one good example of that is that uh, we did a Zoom presentation this August um, on the work of the Welcome Home Coalition. It's a diverse group of, of more than 65 organizations that uses their collective resources to provide affordable housing and uh, housing possibilities for the homeless. And the state had just passed uh, the housing measure in um, our May election. And so Tyler McGinnis, the executive director of the coalition laid out the priorities for the use of that money. So we had quite a few people there who were interested in how they could get involved and help promote all of those priorities that they had. Um, Can I ask one? Uh -huh. Could you tell me the name of the program again? Welcome Home Coalition. Thank you. Another example is um, when local and state newspapers began to focus on the dismal representation of women in technology, we invited a representative of PDX WIT, which is Portland Women in Technology, and Shauna Levy informed us about some impressive efforts to help women 
and other underrepresented groups to the tech community. But was more interesting to us is not only to pull them in, but to provide the support to keep them there. So that was an impressive uh, stand that they have in trying to get women involved. Um, we also had a speaker, Kaya Sands, who's the executive director of Street Roots, uh, which really provides informal social services for the homeless. And she spoke to our branch at our 2018 holiday luncheon. Um, and in addition to providing a twice monthly newspaper, she explained that um, it also provides advocacy and connection among people living on the street. So she explained to us how we could support that organization and make sure that they have the funding required to be able to provide those services. Um, and then in 2019 at our holiday luncheon, we um, asked for Laura Moulton who founded Street Books that provides uh, books to the homeless population. So we were able to do book donations and also reading glasses for her efforts. So those are two. The third one are those that highlight amazing women doing remarkable things in Portland and in Oregon and around the nation. Um, I know that other programs have done this, but we often invite our scholarship recipients to address our membership at an annual or a general meeting. And these young women discuss how they plan to use the scholarship funds awarded and, and talk about their plans for the future as they build on their careers. And often we have uh, someone come back years later. Um, we had one one time who was just starting a master's program. So it's good to, for people to see that their efforts really do pay off in big ways for women. And then in our general meeting in 2019, we invited Liliana Lula, Luna, excuse me, who's a, a DACA recipient. And she founded the first Dreamer Center on the community college campus. And then she also discussed a clothing and toiletries donation that she personally took to the border a couple of times for refugees. And many of our members then contributed to the need list that she outlined. Um, when we do our honors luncheon, we try to do things that are a little lighter. So um, in 2019, we invited Faryal Abbasi Naim, who's a Palestinian embroiderer. And um, she discussed how the art she created and passed down to her daughters, told the stories from her birthplace in Palestine to her life in Syria, and then here in the US and Massachusetts, and finally in Milwaukee, Oregon. Um, very interesting focus on how we all can pass down our own legacies through art or writing or other ways that we um, encompass in order to tell our stories. And then one last thing about this group is that sometimes we focus on amazing women uh, through films. And so we all view this changes everything one time that drew our attention to the women like Gina Davis who have been fighting for decades for women to have equal representation in the film industry. And then one time we showed the Eagle Huntress, which told the story of a 13-year-old Mongolian girl who became the first female in 12 generations to be an Eagle Hunter. So the program pl planning committee that I work with helps lay out the annual calendar of programs that attempts to appeal, appeal to all of our members. But a little bit later, I'll talk about the ones that take us the longest, but I think have the greatest impact. And those are the ones that we do in cooperation with other organizations as a collaborative uh, effort. All right, super interesting. That's a great approach. So Linda Liebecker, you wanna talk about some of your approaches? Well, I've been with the Hillsboro Forest Grove uh, branch, I think since 2007. And we've gone through stages or different aspects. I mean, we've had the traditional one person um, organizes it, but we've much more sort of an informal committee, I guess, maybe the uh, uh, approach in the last few years. We, like I think Ilga Ross mentioned at Tigard, um, that we've done uh, the, the thing where we had a strategic planning uh, session at a different time than our regular meetings. We usually do it about May. 
And interestingly enough, different people come up, come some, often than the, come to the regular meetings. And where we just look, we usually use the strategic plan or the priorities of national as the guideline, kind of to arrange things and topics and just do brainstorming. And uh, I know one of our um, leaders who was a good um, facilitator and a former president of ours mentioned that if sometimes there's ideas up there that people like, but if there's no one really passionate about it, it's just not going to get done. So it just gets, doesn't get up to the top. So some, it's another way to prioritize what gets done, I'd say. Um, so, and then there have been times when we've been without a program uh, vice president for a while. I think right now we're, our person re resigned. And we've just, we've done a similar thing with the board. Um, done brainstorming, planned out things and different people step up to take charge of a program. Um, and then the, at the board meetings, we just kind of have a meeting. Okay, how's everything on track? We have any problems? Do we need help? Kind of, and so similar to what a vice president would do. So I wanted to say that, so if we have branches that are uh, struggling with lack of energy, that there's some you know, different methods you know, you know, to, to get to the same uh, process. Well, I was looking to mention, we've had people who said, who said um, you know, I'll book the room, I have access to a room we can use for a good price, um, or, and, or someone else that once said, I, I'm happy to bring coffee and, a, and the, um, you know, cookies or snacks or, or just the coffee, and I say, go for it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's, you know, those, the, some of those kinds of um, jobs are, are spread out, and, and if people want to be involved in whatever way, I think that's all good. I um, mean, we kind of come to that. So it's a, a group of people are putting together programs. Um, let's see, brainstorming is, has, I thought that that's the um, first step, I think, in everything, every type of programming position we have done and in, in different ways. Um, we usually, I usually use a strategic plan and priorities uh, to just kind of give us general topics to get started and then hold on to every idea. Um, if we're going to do a committee, people step up, take a, on a program, um, you know, that's great. I would always say, keep a couple of ideas as your backup plan. And sometimes those have been ones that, well, they're not quite on our mission, but people are kind of interested, but, but it would be easy because we know this person's, you know, available and local. Um, so some of that, I, that's just from experience. Um, sometimes you have to find a, a substitute at the last minute. Um, the other thing, I, I don't know if uh, all branches do this, but we've had discussions. And at times, we've kept our meetings, tried to set them up for the cold calendar year, the same time and date of the month. Sometimes we've had to change it because the speaker wasn't available that week or whatever. But we definitely had input from our branch members that they like putting it on their calendar. They're busy and they like to plan ahead. And I don't know if that's true now in the pandemic, but um, it has, it's been something we've, and I know people go back and forth on that. And that's, I always say, if you don't get an audience, sometimes it is just the, you know, the wrong time for some people. Everybody has their own um, lives. So I, I always don't take it personally sometimes. <laughs> that um, What else? We, I kind of divide up our programs into three categories. And really it's similar to what uh, Linda Lofton said. It's just a little different way of thinking about it. We've had um, programs that were educational or stimulating for our members, but also outreach to the community to try to um, build visibility, provide something interesting to the community. And that would be, uh, you've had candidate forums or inviting um, public officials or various things sometimes. And at some point in the last few years, we decided we didn't have enough energy to do that, you know, eight or nine times a year. So, and some of them things, you know, it was just for us, especially when the newspaper was dying, there's, <laughs> it was hard to get out publicity. So, um, but, but we also realized we wanted some programs where they'd be open to the public, all of our programs are, but we would not really advertise them and have them uh, purposely be more 
informal and for, um, for discussions. So an example of that, we had uh, some students from the Center for Gender Equity from our partner university come talk to us about um, challenges uh, they face on campus versus sexual violence. And, and what I remember a few years ago was a real eye opener to me when was I first learned about uh, the issue of, um, of pronouns and um, the, the transgender students and so forth. And that was, was nice because we could, we felt comfortable and we could ask questions and, and talk. And I said, it was um, open to the public. I think we may have had a guest or two, but it was just for, it was meant to be just for our branch members. And then we've had I, some, I think at least three a year that are a, just a celebration and connection for members. And I think it's something you know, where we have the, maybe a student come that's gotten a scholarship or that's we sponsor the Nick Whistle. Having a college student come is always a shot in the arm for us, I would say. Um, and um, where we've had, and we talk a little bit, we always have a, usually had a fall kickoff where we talk about the year's planned programs, um, what's going on at the national level, a little bit about AEW funds. And then again in December, it was a brunch, we have the tradition of having a brunch, which of course we didn't this year, but, um, and I've seen it go from very elaborate, you know, a small group, and they had a full tea to, to potluck, to kind of, kind of combinations of things. But it's light and fun, as you said, and, and maybe several people um, speak on short, short topics. Um, the other thing we've done in some years, we usually have something in uh, March for women's history. And um, sometimes we haven't found, you know, known of a speaker or something. And we've had a, several years where members got together and researched a topic or a person and presented that and, and did a nice job. And it was very well received and people appreciated it. Um, I, one I remember was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. So, and it's usually, you know, some several members get to work together as a group that don't maybe don't know each other that well and, and present it. And we and we again, that's more just for our our group. Um, this last year, we happened to see an author. Uh, I happened to see in the paper that an author who was teaching at Pacific University in Forest Grove had a new book out. Uh, it was related to women's history. So, um, you know, that was a, a natural. And we of course we had to offer to sell our books. <laughs> to get it to come, um, but you know that those are the kinds of things that um, we've done, and, and how I thought of them as types, and how we now when we plan, we do plan still for the full year, pretty much, and that we um, think about how much effort we're going to put into a few to really reach a big community impact, and then which ones are more for sustaining our branch. Great thoughts, Linda. Thank you. Um, I think those are all things that many of the branches can share. I'm going to just talk real briefly about my experience as program chair in Lake Oswego. Um, and I came in a couple of years after I had retired from Portland State. And I'd been there for 23 years, so I had a lot of contacts, um, mostly there, but in the community as well. But my approach was a little bit different. Um, I came up with a list of programs that I thought would be interesting, programs and or speakers. And then I went to our board and I said, so what do you think of these? And it was like 12 or 13 topics. And we decided to do a, a survey monkey to the entire branch. And that way we felt like we were gonna get some buy-in about who would actually attend some of these meetings. We have a really fantastic publicity person who was able to connect with a lot of the resources in the community. Um, and especially the Lake Oswego and Westland um, newspapers. Well, that's changed greatly now, but all of our meetings were open to the public. So we were able to get a good story in every, almost every time that we had a meeting. So we'd have a picture and a story. We would get people from the community to our meetings and I think it was really helpful in attracting membership, but also letting people know exactly what it is that we do. Um, so that was that was our approach. It was in a way it was a committee. It was collaborative, but 
but we were able to hone in on the things that we really wanted to do that related to our mission. So I would like to hear from some of the other branches about what you're doing and how you're solving problems if you're having trouble finding a program person. Any remarks from anybody? Any suggestions? Arlene, I think you guys have an interesting approach in Gresham. I'm putting you on the spot, girl. <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, it sounds pretty familiar, um, similar to what the other branches do. We do come up with a list of brainstorming and um, we even keep the list from the previous year. So we have something to start with. And sometimes we have more programs than we can put on in a year. So that helps the previous year. And then we have several people who do um, contact other um, presenters, but we do pretty much the same kinds of things that we do. We try to keep it as local as possible, but not always. And it, we do have our um, scholarship and Nick Whistle recipients come to our meetings, not so much as a presenter, but just to present them to the, to the branch. That's great. I think some of our most popular programs have been with students. Uh, we did one, one of my first couple of years in the branch where I asked a woman who ran the international student program at Portland State to bring four international students, women students, to talk about their experiences and what they hoped to achieve when they went home. We couldn't end the program. People kept asking them questions. And they were so wonderful. They were from all over the world, Egypt, China, India. Yeah. And it was just a fascinating program to hear what they took from, from our country that they wanted to take home. So students are always popular. Um, Sue Klumpf, what have you got down there in Grants Pass that you want to talk about? I am going to call out my own president who's with us. Oh, good. Um, Lee, would you want to talk a little bit about, I'm thinking the round table that we do at our meetings might be a great point of interest to discuss, but okay. you are our brain, she, she's, Lee is our everything. So oh, I'm going to ask sweet. We got to <laughs> hang on to you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the most part, I was going to say, our, we have a committee and we are very similarly run as some of the same things you're saying. They meet in June and uh, July and they plan out the whole year and we have a variety of speakers. Um, one of the things we do is we have, Sue mentioned this, we try to have in the spring a round table, which is a full day event. Uh, it, it involves food, of course, and it's a lot of fun. It's very casual and we do a lot of brainstorming there and it's open to all the branch members. So at that time, we are able to cover a lot of business. We try to train uh, new uh, board members and their new positions, but we also brainstorm on what do people wanna see at the, at the programs. And we are maybe not quite as formal as uh, others. Um, we do have some light ones. I mean, one program that unfortunately fell through at the last minute was belly dancing. Um, <laughs> so we've just decided to try to mix it up. We've got some that are, that are very serious, uh, we've had, you know, human trafficking and um, somebody who works at the prison and deals with women. Uh, we've had people come in from, you know, women's crisis. And so we get to know what's going on in our community and how we can help. And then we kind of balance it out with something that's, that's a lot of fun. Uh, last week, we had somebody from Canine Angels, which trains service dogs for children and uh, we, we said, oh, gosh, you know, that's not mission based, really. But the reality was it's our mission to reach out into the community. And so we had a pretty good turnout for, for, a, for Zoom meeting. And the women were really excited and had a lot of questions. And I thought, right now, that's, that's good enough. Um, one suggestion that I might have that wasn't mine, it was actually uh, our very own Georgia Applegate's idea. And um, she was talking about um, women suffragists and we just decided at the last minute that we would assign our branch members some homework. 
and that they should go and research a suffragette, a suffragist, excuse me, I don't want to belittle them by saying suffragette, suffragist from their home state and be prepared to share a couple of minutes on their, what they learned. Well, uh, you know, two hours later, I, mean, I just simply had to wrap it up, girls. You know, it's time to eat. It's meal time. You know, I mean, they, we had women who came that we've never seen before. We had women talking I've never met over the many years I've been there. It was really good. So this was one that's sort of collaborative among your own members, and we facilitated it. But everybody got a chance to speak, and they could present if they wanted to. And so we sort of shared the, the role of guest speaker. Anyway, that was just something we did recently that was surprisingly um, really successful. What a great idea, Lee. I love that idea. That's something people can still do. I mean, it's 2020 is over, but it's still 100 years since we got the vote. So what a terrific more, idea for engaging. Thing, Lee, can you tell them a little bit about the table talk that you do at the meetings? Because I think that would be a really good point of interest. Okay. Um, we decided that um, we, we had gotten some feedback that some of our members just felt like they that we weren't listening to them, that they weren't engaged. And then they would come to speak. Uh, we, they would come to hear the speakers and then uh, we would go home and there were a lot of decisions being made and branch members maybe not being heard. So we decided a couple of years ago that we would add a, a short segment, maybe 10 to 15 minutes at the end of every branch meeting after the guest speaker and after a very brief business meeting with some announcements, we would add table talks. And table talks was a time where we picked a topic and then we asked branch members to discuss it. Um, when we were meeting in person, our favorite forum was, you know, everybody sat at tables. And so you would have paper and pencil and you'd brainstorm with the people at your table. And we would pick topics that were important to us. And they might be, um, we want you to pick the top five strategic plan ideas out of these 10 or uh, we might want to ask them about an event that we are not sure whether we should do or not and what should we do with our money and you know it was all over the map and some of it very serious and the women responded they got involved they got engaged and then we would do a readout so somebody from your table speak what did you guys decide in your small group discussion and again we finally had to just say sorry gals it's just time to wrap it up but we again the same idea that with table talks, the women got a chance to weigh in. And then those of us who were on the board could, were taking copious notes. You know, we had, a, we had to ask them to write it down as well. And then we could take it back to the board and say, look, this is what our members want. They want to see more of this, so they want to see more of that. And, um, and they felt heard, we hope, anyway. That's terrific. You know, I think sometimes our members do feel sort of disengaged. They say, oh, you know, we'll let the board take care of that. We don't have to weigh in. We just go to our book group or whatever. So that's that's really terrific. Um, so I want to go back. Yeah, can we can we can, are you in a where I can uh, stop? Can I stop you for a second? Sure. And look at yeah. the chat. Um, uh -huh. Katie asked, uh, Katie made the comment. I have found that serving on the program committee is a great way to groom leadership. And we had a question from Connie, how successful have programs been since we need to be virtual now? Well, I think Nancy Brown, you and I can answer that. You know, we've, this is like what the 16th Zoom meeting we've had for continuing education. And we did how many over the summer at summer skills camp? 10. 10. And you know, they've been really successful. I mean, sometimes we see just the same people, but t depending on the topic, we see some new faces and some new interest and people have good questions. So I think they're, they're successful if you get something that your branch members are interested in and will be engaged with. Um, we've had a couple of really good programs in our branch last month, and I know Tiger did this as well. We had a policeman who was talking about community policing in this time, and that was extremely well attended. So I think it depends on what your topic is and, and what your branch members are interested in. But I wanted to go back to my lady Linda's 
and have them share a couple of their favorite. I know Linda Lofton has some graphics, some of their favorite programs over the years. I know you did a few of those, Linda, but let's let's hear some others. Okay, um, the first one was when Ilga was our uh, branch president and Barbara Spencer was our coordinator, our liaison with colleges and universities. So it was called An Evening with Brenda Tracy. Do you have that, Nancy? Um, you yeah. might be, thank you. You might be familiar uh, with the story that was reported by John Cozano for the Oregonian in 2014. But um, in 1998, Brenda was a single mother to two little kids and she was drugged and sexually assaulted by four players on the Oregon State football team. Um, the individuals were arrested, but they were never charged in connection to the case. And the evidence of the case was destroyed before the statute of limitations had expired. So there were no criminal charges ever filed. And since that article, Tracy helped to pass a number of laws in Oregon, including one that extends the statute of limitations for sexual assaults from six years to 20, and also passes a law that requires state police to process the backlog of untested rape kits. Uh, and they have to report progress in that process to the legislature on an annual basis. And she was also instrumental in creating rules on college campuses to protect victims of sexual assault, like the mandate to create confidential assault responders on campuses. So in 2017, the Portland branch partnered with PSU's Women's Resource Center yeah. Uh, also, their Illuminate program, the Global Diversity and Inclusion Department, and the Athletics Department to produce this evening with Brenda Tracy. Uh, 400 people attended, including 200 members of the Viking Athletic Program. Uh, Barbara Spencer um, and Diane Wynn uh, at the time were instrumental in organizing this. But Brenda told her story and she described the legislation proposed and passed related to sexual assault. And she explained her nonprofit uh, Set the Expectation campaign, which includes a pledge for coaches and teams and schools to create awareness of sexual abuse on campuses, as, as well as what campuses have put into place to help assault uh, victims. So it was good to be able to share that, but also to see such a presence of, of athletes at that event. And then another example, I know that many AAUW branches across the country have sponsored voting brunches, um, but our branch partners every two years with the YWCA and the League of Women Voters and sometimes City Club of Portland and the Oregon Women Equity Coalition to highlight ballot measures aligned with our mission. And we meet often to determine the speakers to present in favor or in opposition to each ballot measure and to plan the logistics for the event, including the meal. These brunches are always uh, well attended and they're pretty lively and engaging. Uh, of course, in 2020, it was a little more challenging, but our own Trish Garner stepped up and moderated a Zoom session and sometimes she had to present both before and against um, <laughs> the measures chosen as only Trish can do. Um, so when we, when we don't have to meet uh, digitally, participants pay $10 to cover the cost of the brunch, but no one is ever denied for lack of a ticket. The only, the only problems that we've had is that we've had to, we had a limit on the number of people that we could um, receive into the venue that we had. Um, a third type is something that we also did about Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we have uh, in one of the buildings downtown, we have this woman um, whose name is Jane Von Bosker, who does this one woman show about Eleanor Roosevelt. So we did this at the old church, which is an events venue in downtown Portland. Uh, the program committee and our funds chair negotiated a more than reasonable price for the venue. And Jane, who performed, lived uh, because she lives downtown, she was willing to give us a very um, reasonable price on her program. Um, so we also, also had the author of the play came to our production and answered questions afterwards. 
uh, many of our members actively sold tickets for $25. And we knew that the cost of the ticket was pretty low for a professionally produced play, but we were very nervous about breaking even. We had posters and flyers made and disseminated, um, but we did manage to profit enough money to support two scholarships for women returning to school. So big sigh of relief over that one. But we've been reluctant to do it again. It's just a little bit nerve wracking. And maybe some of you've had that experience. The last one was also something that we put together in April of 2019, also at the old church. Uh, Diane Wynn, who many of you know, um, is a member of our planning committee. And she told us about a program series that the old church sponsors called We Can Listen which offers programs from individuals and grassroots organizations that promote understanding about social justice issues. So uh, we met, first of all, Diane and I met with an amazing woman who had pre previously presented at one of our honors luncheons. Jane Vogel is the founder, founder of uh, Advanced Gender Equity in the Arts. Um, she calls it AGE. And she helped us define the direction for an idea that we got from our members. So many people have asked over the last couple of years, what does transgender mean? What are these pronoun pronouns all about? And what are the challenges that transgender uh, adolescents and adults um, are confronted with? So for eight months, we met with five others from Transactive Gender Project at Lewis and Clark Graduate School OHSU's Transgender Health Program, Kaiser Permanente's Gender Health, and the Gender and Sexuality Studies at Portland State University. Um, the Oregon Commission for Women assisted in disseminating information about the program, and AAUW Oregon supported the program with a $500 grant, which I highly recommend that some of you might want to apply for every year, uh, which was used primarily for honorariums for the participants. Uh, the program opened with music from a queer a cappella singing group called Accord, and it was followed by an onstage conversation with four transgender adolescents and their mentor. After a short break, four transgender professionals had an onstage discussion about how much has changed in this struggle for acceptance and civil rights and what the next steps are in ensuring that transgender youth and adults are protected and nurtured as members of our society. Um, and the last presenter was an 11 year old transgender girl who described what she sees as a perfect world for the future for transgender individuals. And then pre-program and during the break, we had a slideshow loop that depicted definitions related to transgender expression, as well as the challenges that individuals confronted in their lives. And then the 200 audience participants left with two handouts, one with terms and terminology and the other with resources for further information. And the program was recorded by the old church as a podcast, as well as by a local radio station as part of a national conversation. So it was a lot of work, but the program was powerful and very moving. And we did get some positive feedback just this past December uh, Jane Vogel, who helped us organize this, told us about a friend who had been struggling with accepting his transgender, transgender son. And the moving testimonies from the young people on stage just helped him transform his understanding as well as his relationship with his son. And the other story she told was of a woman in her building whose child was in the process of transitioning. And she appreciated all of the resources, which allowed her not only to further connect with her son, but also to help them in the process. So <clears throat> even though we complain about the eight months of, of meeting and organizing that and stressing over it, it really did make a difference. Oh, thank you, Linda. That was an ex extremely important program. I heard about it and I'm, I wish I could have participated. I'm sorry I didn't. Um, Linda, do you have a couple of outstanding programs you wanna share? That's a pretty hard act to follow. It is. It is. I want to make sure that we share some programs that other people can use as well. You know, I, so I'm going to give, I was thinking back, and I'm, I'm not very good at looking backwards. I tend to look forward. But I was thinking back, and one of the first candidate forums we did 
any branch could do, I'm sure, it was we had a, a we, our, our branch covers several cities and parts of Western uh, Washington County. We had a county commissioner race. It was kind of a hot race running. There were only two of them running. We invited them both. They came to one of our meetings. And it was one of those where we were all kind of around one big table. I think there was only, at the time, 15 or 16 of us. But we had set questions for them. But And members, it felt, I, all the members felt, you know, they're voters. They want to be informed. They got to ask questions we were interested in. It was just, it, you know, it was, I think it's sometimes the, it's easy to overlook the real local things. Um, another one that I remember that I know made a difference to the community, and it was just information for the our branch members. We had someone from NARAL come out to talk to our branch about contraception offerings in school, high schools, in the school district health clinics. And that was a big issue at that point on their school board. And the school board uh, races all were contested. And I know our uh, members, you know, we we're nonpartisan, but our members took, were, took that information and went out and did activism in their own worlds and certainly made a difference in the school boards uh, that year. So that was, that felt good for our members. So sometimes, um, I guess just as another, an idea is remembering that we can do things at the very local level too. Great. Yeah, I'm going to share at the very end a, a handout that I'll leave for you that has some ideas about the kinds of people that you can partner with. I'm just going to share a couple uh, and Nancy, just put them up on the screen and I'll just talk about them. Um, in Lake Oswego, we have a, a program that's sponsored by the Lake Oswego Library called Lake Oswego Reads. And every year our branch does a program in combination with that. Um, and it's always in February. And a couple of years ago, the book was something called The Book of Unknown Americans. And it was about immigrants from Mexico um, to the, the uh, Northeast Coast. And um, I read in the Portland State Magazine that there, here is this young man, um, Luis Baldera Viagrana, who is a dreamer and he was student body president. He came out as a dreamer and was elected as student body president. So as part of our relationship with Lake Oswego Reads, I asked Luis to come and speak with us. And he and I did sort of an interview. I thought he would bring a couple of friends, but they were a little nervous about showing themselves publicly. So he came and we had an interview and it was so powerful. He's a soft-spoken young man, but a definite leader. He came to America when he was seven or eight. His family lived in Eastern Oregon where there was a lot of discrimination, but he had a teacher that really adopted him and helped him. He learned English fairly quickly and did a lot of uh, interpreting for his family for legal things and banking and things like that. Just an outstanding young man. He has since graduated. I've reached out to him, but I haven't heard back from him. So I hope he's doing well. Um, but that was an outstanding program. We had a huge uh, civic presence um, because of him and because of Lake Oswego Reads. So next one. So a, a colleague on our board, um, Karen Rotink, is an amazing person. She's our publicist, but she also has a lot of contacts. She sat next to Ellen Rosenblum at dinner one night um, and <laughs> asked her if she would come and speak at our branch, which she did. And she was definitely a highlight. Um, after that, she went on to speak at our convention over in Salishan. Um, but she was a wonderful speaker and, and, and a big highlight for us. And last, Roberta Phillip was back in 2014, the chair of the Oregon Commission on Women. And she, came to talk to us about pay inequality in Oregon. And of course we know it's, it's um, countrywide. In fact, it's worldwide, let's face it. But she gave us a lot of great statistics and, and did a wonderful talk. So we've had a lot of others that are things that are fairly, fairly simple. Um, last year we had a girls robotics team um, from uh, Westland High School 
And they came and demonstrated their robotics in front of us. It was so fun. They were so articulate. They won a big, uh, a big contest. So they're just um, an example of what you can do with students. They're so inspirational. Everybody was just, we all wanted to give them money and everything else. So last, um, I'm going to put up, have Nancy put up just an outline of some things that you can think about and probably most of you here already know a lot of these, but they're just ideas for people that you can contact because a lot of your members have these contacts in the community. So, you know, we've had an, a doctor who talked about women's health. Uh, we've had, we have a couple of legislators in our branch, but, uh, one of whom he's not in our branch, but his mother is, is um, the state, uh, the Senate majority leader, Rob Wagner. So he's come to talk to us a couple of times. City council members are a good source of information. Teachers talking, women owned businesses, women on nonprofit or corporate boards, students, collaborative community events like I just talked about. Uh, we had a public broadcasting official and a reporter at, at the Lake Oswego um, Review come and talk to us about fake news. And it was a wonderful program. It's really great. And other community partners, um, yes, we can send this document. I think, Nancy, right? Yeah. Um, other community partners like the League of Women Voters, I know many of you do things with them, candidates forums and things like that, and uh, authors, journalists, bloggers. I'm sure that all of you have other ideas and we'd love to hear them in the last few minutes that we have. Nancy, they wanna know if we can send this out. Too many buttons, <laughs> too little time. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to put the link right in the chat, oh, okay, and so chat. people can okay. download it directly, but I will also send it out. Well, I'll actually, I attach it to the YouTube because I don't generally send out a, an email after we have a session. Oh, um, great. Okay. Because you, everyone's sick and tired of hearing from me. Oh, and they unsubscribe, right? And they unsubscribe, and it makes me cry. So yeah. I want to see, I see Dolores here. Uh, any other suggestions, ideas that you have that are fairly simple to, to uh, connect with. And Joyce does. Um, Joyce? I was just going to say, I've talked to, um, to Pat Lehman recently about uh, the possibility of having climate change be a topic for AAUW because it is really listed as a priority in our public policy. And uh, she mentioned a speaker that they had in Pendleton branch. And uh, so she gave me that connection, but then I also found out that Salem has a special task force on the city council that is currently looking at all of the parameters for Salem uh, to uh, tackle the issues of climate change here. So I might, uh, actually choose to tap one of those uh, task force members to tell us locally about what's happening there. That's a great idea, Joyce, you know, and that reminds me um, in Lake Oswego, we have a diversity, equity and inclusion task force and the city council is meeting to talk about what they should adopt. So there is a, a wonderful topic. We should have one of those speakers come to our branch or be on Zoom. Yeah. Good idea. Ilga, you yeah. had your hand up? Yes, uh, I was going to say with Red Reef, with the climate change, uh, Tiger is planning to have a climate change speaker in May. And this was directly uh, uh, found through a program that Portland had a couple of years ago on climate change. Yeah. So uh, great speakers are available. Yeah. April is Earth Day. Mm -hmm. uh, April, oh, right. April 22nd. Birthday, so that's a really good time to schedule it if you can. <laughs> yeah. Sue? Unmute. The diversity, uh, yes, I did. I got dark. 
Diversity is um, a subject that's really becoming more and more prevalent that I'm seeing in meetings as well. Salem had an incredible meeting on Saturday with um, a great, she was president of the Oregon Black Pioneer Women, uh, Corporation. She told us great history from, you know, very, very early, early, early days where the first Black Pioneers came to Oregon, what a challenge it was. And it was a fascinating discussion. And I know it just kind of fits in with that diversity topic that we've been doing a lot lately. So great job to Salem Branch. Yeah, she was wonderful. Willie, anyone else? I just want to say Marty had a comment that the benefit of scheduling leaders in public service is that they are most often free. <laughs> and they want to get the word out. So That's they're, right. yeah, they want to proselytize a little bit. Anybody else? Add, one time, uh, we, our local branch uh, contacted uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, I think when she was first elected, and asked about what she was planning, what was going on with the AAUW priorities. And she couldn't come, but she sent an aide. And so even, you know, for, uh, I, you know, I think we forget, I forget that sometimes that um, we can have contact all up and down the line. And I remember that one as being pretty interesting. Well, and actually right now with Zoom, they're a little bit more available. I mean, they can record it and ship it off to us and we can use it either as part of a program or, or an entire program. So I think they're going to be a little busy for the next couple of weeks, however. Yeah. It's amazing, though, I think that, um, you know, we complain a lot about Zoom, but it does allow people to use their time. We're going to do one next month on the vaccines. And it was hard for me to ask a very busy medical doctor at OHSU to do it, but she already had done one uh, for professionals at OHSU. And so she's going to align her talk with our age group and the kinds of questions we may have, but it's just so much easier for her to devote an hour than having to get to the venue and, you know, do all of that. It's just much harder for professionals to speak to us. So. Well, I think Nancy Brown has been making that point for months, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just don't want to go anywhere. See, I just want to sit here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can I can put on my sweater but still wear my sweatpants and my and my slippers, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> I was vacuuming one day and it came time for a Zoom meeting. You just turn on the computer, do it, and when you're done, you finish vacuuming. I mean that's it's, right. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I just I put the mission-based program document. Oh, I used the doc the document um, the word document. Sorry, I grabbed the wrong one. Um, it, email me if you want the PDF version. The word document is fine. If, email me if you want any of them and you can't get them off of the chat. Um, generally, all you have to do is click click to open it, and then you can download it to your computer. I see yeah. the PDF now, Nancy. Do you? I don't know what happened. Oh, good. So I'm sure that you all realize this, especially those of you who've been on many of these sessions, but we wouldn't be able to do them without Nancy. You know, it's oh, all well and too. good for us to chit chat, but she's the one behind the scenes pulling all the plugs and making sure everything works and showing our documents and stuff. So pulling the plugs is right. Yeah, pulling the plugs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, any other questions or anything for the good of the order? Happy program planning. I really like the idea that so many of them are, are collaborative and I think it's a, a good approach. Okay. All right, Dolores, Dolores are you saying something? Thank you, Lee, for your participation. We appreciate it. Tremendous good suggestions. Way. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And you know that our next session is uh, Thursday, January 28th at seven o'clock. And it's Trish Garner's uh, anti-racism track, as we're calling it. And this is a woman, Faye Stetz Waters, who's the civil rights director in the office of the attorney general. And she's going to talk about what Oregon is doing um, to address bias and hate and how we can help. So I think that's gonna be a really interesting program as all of Trisha's programs have been. 
so that's Thursday, January 28th. Oh my gosh, we're almost at the end of the month. That's seven. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Thank Thanks you so much. Bye-bye.